Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for joining me and letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. And I need to begin by apologizing for my voice a little bit. Uh, I've come down with a cold, and I think I can get through this, but uh, I hope it's not too distracting. I'll be sure to edit out uh, all the coughing and, and the sniffling, if I can help it. But I am excited to get a chance to cover four books of Scripture with you this week. Enos, Jerem, Omni, and the Words of Mormon. And I know that sounds like a lot, but each of those books are really short, just one chapter long in each case. And we're going to be spending the bulk of our time in Enos. But remember, teachers, if you're interested in getting access to the materials that I put together for teachers to help reduce your preparation time, increase your confidence in the classroom, and help you to create edifying classroom experiences, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. But if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. For an object to begin in Enos, bring in some silverware, a plate, and a cup, and set it at the front of the class. For an icebreaker, ask your students to share with their neighbor their answer to the following question. What is your favorite food? If you could have any food appear right now in front of you, what would you want it to be? Or what is your favorite restaurant to eat at and your favorite dish at that restaurant? Is it steak, pizza, Mexican food, ice cream, sushi, bacon? My favorite food, I love Brazilian barbecue the kind where they walk in every five minutes with a different cut of meat to try, along with a big buffet of rice and beans and salads and cheese bread and all the good stuff that I loved on my mission, and then wash it all down with a glass of Guaraná, my favorite Brazilian soda. Ah, that, that is the best. So I'm hungry now. Have I gotten you hungry yet? Or one other additional idea you could try. If you really wanted to make an impression on your students, bring some food in that has a really good smell. One time I brought in one of those little George Foreman grills and I put some bacon on it. And as my students entered the room, I had it cooking and sizzling and leaving that delicious bacon smell in the air. That is certain to get them feeling hungry, which is what you want. And if you have a hungry stomach, What's the best way to remedy that? You open your mouth and feed it. Today, we're going to study a story about a hungry young man, which shouldn't surprise us. Most young men are hungry, right? His name was Enos, Jacob's son. But it's not his stomach that's hungry. It's his what? According to Enos chapter 1, verse 4. His soul hunger. Now, perhaps he started out that day with a hungry stomach, and that's why he goes out to hunt wild beasts in the forest. But it turns out that when he actually gets out there, it's not his stomach that begins to gnaw at his insides and cry out for nourishment, but his soul. And if you have a hungry soul, what's the best way to remedy that? You open your mouth and pray. That's a great way to feed a soul with prayer. And to help make this lesson a little more personally relevant to you today, I want you to ponder what your soul is most hungry for right now. If you could choose just one prayer that you could have answered right now, today, what would it be? The book of Enos is essentially the story of a man who desired an answer from his heavenly father and what he was willing to do to obtain it. Enos prayed for forgiveness, his people, his enemies, and the preservation of the scriptures. And with your request in mind, study the book of Enos looking for what he did that led to his answers. Perhaps that will help you to find yours. 
And for this lesson, I'd like to focus on two messages or aspects of prayer. One, the hows of prayer. And two, the promises of prayer or the blessings of fervent prayer. The Book of Enos can help us to understand both of these principles. So our first question, the hows. How did Enos pray? You probably already know that Enos's prayer gets answered, but what did he do that helped him to receive that answer? There's a few things that I would want to try to help my students to see. Whenever we see pictures of the story of Enos depicted in art, he's typically on his knees in the forest because this is a story, at least in part, about prayer. And yet, how many times does the actual word prayer or prayed appear in the book? It might surprise you to discover that it only shows up three times. Now, it does have the word pray with an E in verse 20. Uh, the Lamanites fed on beasts of prey, but that doesn't count, right? So a quick challenge. Can you find the three times? If I were teaching youth, I might throw out a small treat to whoever could find one first. And we see it in verse 4, verse 11, and verse 12. And that's it. You'd think that prey would show up a whole lot more often in this story. You know what? In a way, it actually does. As an idea, it shows up a whole lot more in this story. It's just that Enos uses much better words and phrases to describe that communication with his heavenly father. So what I'd like you to do is to read the first 18 verses of Enos and just pull out and mark every word or phrase that Enos uses instead of the word prayer. Anything that suggests the manner of communication with God. And what are they? As a teacher, I would make this list of verses up on the board and just fill in the answers as they search. If the verse appears more than once on the list, then that means that there are that many different synonyms for prayer in that verse. But what are they? From verse 2, wrestle. From verse 4, there's four of them. Cried mighty prayer, supplication, raise my voice high. And jump to verse 9. Feel a desire. Pour out my whole soul. Verse 10. Struggling in the Spirit. Verse 11. Many long strugglings. 12 labored with all diligence. 15. Cried unto him continually. And 16. Cried. Now, aren't those fantastic words and phrases? Maybe we should start using these more often to describe our communication with God. I think that sometimes we use certain gospel words so often that they kind of begin to lose their meaning. Prayer is one of those words. And I'm afraid that sometimes I believe our prayers begin to lose their meaning as well. And I know that, that I fall into that trap at times. I wonder if my prayers are getting very far. And I have no doubt that our Father in Heaven listens to our prayers and that we're blessed for the effort that we make. But we could be getting so much more out of that experience. What verb do we most often use to describe what we do with our prayers? We blank our prayers. Say. We say our prayers. And perhaps that's the problem. We just say them. We, we kind of have our, our favorite repeated phrases that we often use. We kneel down, fold our arms, and say but what if we started using some of Enos's verbs instead? What if we instead said something like, I need to go pour out my whole soul to God. Or I need to go wrestle with the Lord over an issue in my life. 
You think that that might change the nature of our prayers? I think it would. What do you think those particular words and phrases suggest about receiving answers to prayer? Wrestle, strugglings, pour out, labor. What that suggests to me is that receiving answers to prayer requires effort. Sincere, earnest, thoughtful prayer. 2 Nephi 32.9 instructed us to pray always and not faint. To not give up too easily. To be diligent and engaged in our efforts to connect with God. We can't expect God to always come rescue us at our beck and call. Receiving an answer to prayer isn't like ordering room service, where your answer is promptly delivered on a silver platter. It's not a text message where you type in your request and the Lord answers a few seconds later with a smiley face emoji at the end. It's a process. It's a labor, a challenge, and I believe it's meant to be. And another question, why? Why does God often make us work hard for our answers? And it's a good question. Uh, what do you think? In my mind, effort creates value. Things that we obtain too easily are often valued less. God wants us to value the answer, and I think we appreciate them much more when we work for them. My testimony of the Book of Mormon came at the end of years of sincere seeking and praying. If I'd received an answer the first time I requested it, I don't believe that experience would have meant as much to me. Also, our effort is a reflection of our longing. It may be the Lord's means for testing the sincerity of our desire. When somebody gives up on something too easily, sends the message that maybe we didn't care much about it. And therefore, how should we pray? We should pray ardently or fervently. Another insight that I think it's important to mention, especially in our day and age, would be to point out the conditions Enos was in that made it possible for him to receive an answer to his prayers. Look in verse 3. Behold, I went to hunt beasts in the forests. So therefore, what was the circumstance? What was the setting? He was alone and away from the world in a place where he could focus, meditate, and open his heart and mind to the voice of the Lord. Do you think Enos would have had the same experience if he'd brought his cell phone and his AirPods? Probably not. I believe that most of us could probably use a little more silence in our lives. Silence seems to be a rare commodity these days, because our world is filled with noise. We can't even walk anywhere without having to have something to look at or play or listen to. Between classes at school, or during class even, uh, students are constantly looking at their little screens or drowning out the world around them with their earphones. Now, I'm not a Luddite. I, I use these things too, and they're convenient and helpful. But are we making time for silence, meditation, contemplation. The New Testament tells us that Jesus often made time to be alone in nature to commune with his Father in heaven. Not that it's required to go into nature to receive answers to prayer, but for me personally, I do find that that helps. And in his book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis gives voice to the devils who tempt us. And I really like this part where a senior devil says to his trainee, it's funny how mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. May I suggest that if you wish to receive answers to your prayers, that you make time in your life for silence. Turn off the television, the cell phone, and the radio. And somewhere in that sweet melody of silence, you might hear the voice of the Lord whispering your answer. 
Another brief thought. I found that at times, some of the greatest spiritual experiences that we can have don't always have to happen when we're in church or listening to general conference or during a gospel class or even at the moment we're studying the scriptures. Sometimes those moments of insight and inspiration come later when we're alone or going about our day or spending some time in nature. Those are the times when our soul has an opportunity to reflect and ponder on the things that we've heard. And then the Spirit can take the opportunity to sink those truths and insights deeper into our hearts. Next, what do these words and phrases suggest about how Enos prayed? I cried unto him in mighty prayer, and I did still raise my voice high that it reached the heavens. So what's Enos doing there, apparently? He's praying out loud. This can really make a difference at times. Of course, we can always say a prayer in our hearts and minds. We can say prayers in a crowd or surrounded by other people, and God is going to hear those prayers. But there's a special power that comes from finding a place where we can pray out loud. Perhaps it's because it seems more like a real conversation. If you're finding it hard to connect with God, or you really wish to demonstrate the depth of your desire on a deeper level, try finding a place where you can say your prayers aloud. Elder Holland, in this most recent general conference, instructed us to pray vocally when it's possible. Another thought, one of the more well-known aspects of the Ena story is found in verse 4, where we find that Enos prayed all day and into the night. Now, I know of individuals who have gone out and tried to replicate that by staying on their knees for hours and hours. I'm not so sure that that's the intended message of the story. That if you want an answer to your prayers, then you got to pray for hours and hours until the answer comes. I think that the more important principle I get from that detail is that answers to prayer often take time. Some prayers can be answered immediately, but most require days, weeks, months, or even years before the answer comes. So don't give up on your prayer if you feel like you still haven't gotten an answer. Your answer just might require some long strugglings, some more wrestling, and some pouring out. So how did Enos pray? He prayed a lot. Kind of reminds me of the parable of the importuning friend in Luke chapter 11, where, where the neighbor comes and knocks and knocks until the master of the house finally answers. And Jesus says that the friend doesn't get up to help him because he's his friend, but because of his friend's importunity. What's importunity? Persistence. We are like Enos, need to be persistent in our prayers. Joseph Smith said, Weary the Lord until he blesses you. If you don't feel like you've received an answer to your prayer, bruise your knuckles on heaven's door until you feel you've received one. But I say that with a quick caution. Persistence in prayer is not an encouragement to keep praying until God gives you exactly what you want. It's an encouragement to keep praying until he gives you an answer. Remember Joseph Smith asking God if he could give the 116 pages to Martin Harris. He got his answer and then kept pushing for a different one. We all know how that ended up. The Lord's answer may be no. That's not going to bless you. Or the answer may be, you're asking the wrong question. Or the answer may be, wait, you're not quite ready for the answer. Or sometimes the answer might even be, it doesn't matter what you do on this occasion. Decide for yourself, and I will support you in your decision. Remember that prayer is not so much about aligning God's will to ours, but our will to his. 
So hopefully as we pray, we, we do it with an open mind. Keep praying until you receive your answer. But be willing to accept the one that you receive. So I suppose a, a, a neat little way we could sum up the answer to the question of how Enos prayed is to say that he prayed ardently, alone, aloud, and a lot. If we follow this pattern, I believe that we can receive the same kind of results that Enos did. What are those results? We've taken a look at some of the hows of prayer, but let's take a look at what the Lord did for Enos because of those efforts. I'd entitle this portion of the lesson, The Promises of Prayer. And you could cover this as a quick activity with this handout, if you're interested. What you do is you read the following verses and look for the words that go in the blanks. And then use the numbered squares to discover one of my favorite quotes on prayer from William Shakespeare. Here are the answers. From 1, 5. Thy sins are forgiven. Also from 1, 5. Thou shalt be blessed. From 1, 6. My guilt was swept away. Verse 8. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Verse 11. My faith began to be unshaken. Verse 12, I will grant unto thee according to thy desires. Verse 15, ye shall receive it. Verse 16, he covenanted with me. Verse 17, my soul did rest. Now, if you filled all those in and you used the numbered squares, the quote says, My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts never to heaven go. But I do, I do like that thought. And have you ever felt like your prayers get like that? I know mine do at times. Words without thoughts. I wonder how often our prayers don't even get past the ceiling because... There's no thoughts to go with them. And maybe that's one of the major differences between rote prayer and wrestling and pouring out your whole soul to God. Well, a like in the scriptures question. When have you seen one of those blessings come to you through fervent prayer? Can any of you think of a time when you wrestled with the Lord and received an answer or a blessing like these from God? Have you ever had your guilt swept away, your desires granted, or your soul put at rest? Our truth, then, praying ardently, alone, aloud, and a lot can lead to answers. Or put another way, we might say, patient, persistent, persevering, and passionate prayer leads to promises. And there's a video you might consider showing here. It's called, I Pray When, which depicts a number of people holding up signs with the way that they completed that sentence. And it's really touching and, and can help your class to see the many different situations in which prayer can be a blessing and a help to us. And if you liked, you could do that same activity with your students. Ask them to create their own sign and fill in that sentence. When do they pray and how does it help them? And you know, Enos left that morning planning on hunting for something that would feed him physically. Instead, he came back with a fed soul. He left expecting to expend effort and time pursuing wild animals, and instead he pursued forgiveness, blessings, and promises by wrestling and struggling with the Spirit all day long and into the night. By the end of the story, I think it's safe to assume that Enos's hungry soul was fed, and I pray that yours 
will be also. Lesson number two from the Book of Enos. For an object lesson, if you can get your hands on one, see if you can arrange to get a parenting book, or, or a few of them, to display to your class. There are literally thousands of them out there. And chances are, if you're a parent, there may be one on your bookshelf right now. If not, you could always go to the library and check out a few to use as a visual aid. And for an icebreaker to this portion of the lesson, I might begin by saying something like, Parenting is an incredible privilege, but also an incredible responsibility. When we first became parents, my wife and I asked a lot of people for advice and scoured books and internet articles on the subject and had a lot of long discussions about how we wanted to approach that responsibility. And we discovered that there's a lot of parenting advice out there. And a lot of it is conflicting. Therefore, a question. What is the best or worst parenting advice that you have ever received? And, and here are a few humorous examples, uh, and I'll let you decide whether this is good or bad advice. Uh, cherish the day you buy your first minivan, because that will be the last day it is ever clean. After your first child is born, go buy 20 years worth of poster board. This will save you countless 10 p.m. trips to CVS. Tell your kids all the food that you want to keep to yourself is spicy. <laughs> Sorry, dear, this ice cream sandwich is spicy. Don't leave hungry, hungry hippos on the floor of a dark room. I told my kids that the shoes on telephone wires are from kids who lied and got sucked up into space. If you hide 48 eggs and tell your kids that there are 50, you can get a little nap in. Then, we pay our child $1 for every book they read. I'm out $120 this year, and he thinks he's ripping me off. Best investment ever. Well, those are, those are just for fun, right? Some humorous examples. Maybe good, maybe bad advice. But, if you're a parent, would you like to know which books I've found to have the greatest advice on parenting? There are five of them. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the Book of Mormon. In my humble opinion, the scriptures are the greatest parenting manual ever given to mankind. And right here, in the first three verses of the book of Enos, is some of the best parenting advice that I've ever received. So far this year, we've been able to see Jacob in his role as a brother, a preacher, and a prophet. But now we get to see him as a father. It sounds like he must have been an amazing father, a great example for us to seek to emulate. If we find ourselves in the role of parenthood, or just in the role of influencing young people. I believe that most of us can find a way to apply these messages, whether we're parents or not. But what did Jacob do as a parent that blessed Enos in his spiritual development? Let's see what we can find. And I found that in my scripture study, sometimes individual words all by themselves can carry immense power and insight. So I call them power words. Entire sermons can often be taught in just one word. And these particular verses are full of great ones. So here's an activity for you. Read Enos verses 1 through 3 and pick out at least two power words that teach you something about righteous parenting and be prepared to explain why you chose them. Here are some of my favorite words in these verses. Just. Enos knew that his father 
was a just man. Not a perfect man, but just. Something that we can strive to do is to set an example of righteousness for our children. Hopefully they see us as just individuals. And I believe that typically, but not always, our children become a reflection of our values and actions. Therefore, if we want our children to be honest, then we need to be honest. If we want our children to be faithful to their covenants, we need to be faithful to our covenants. If we want our children to study their scriptures, then they need to see us studying our scriptures. Our example can have a profound effect on who they become. So seek to be just. Taught. We need to teach our children both spiritual and secular truths. If we allow only public education and society to teach our children, then I'm afraid that they're going to be spiritually unprepared and in many ways miseducated. And also, I don't think that we can just rely on Sunday school and seminary teachers to do it either. Our children need to be taught spiritually by us as well. This is one of the reasons I'm so thrilled by this Come Follow Me program, which encourages parents to teach their children the gospel. It's one of the reasons I started this channel, is to help parents teach their children the scriptures, which isn't always easy. It does require a certain skill set to be done effectively. Remember that now we are a home-centered, church-supported organization. So, we as parents have a responsibility to teach our children as effectively as we know how. I'm going to do the next two power words together. Nurture and admonition. Those are key words here. I see these as the two great guiding and balancing principles in raising righteous and thriving children. Starting with nurture, what words or synonyms come to mind when you see that word? Care, cherish, love, support, look out for, protect, compassion, praise. Well, what about admonition? What words come to your mind there? Discipline, warn, exhort, Caution, reprove, reprimand. So which of these two things do children need most? Trick question, right? Both. What happens if I do too much of one and not enough of the other? What if all I do is nurture, nurture, nurture? Well, I think they get spoiled, entitled and unprepared for the real world because the real world isn't always a very nurturing place. On the other hand, what if all I do is admonish, admonish, admonish? Well, they, they feel unloved. They don't develop self-confidence. They, they may eventually rebel against all the heavy-handedness. So what's the best way to raise a child? Balance. <laughs> Children need a balance between both nurture and admonition. Now, there was a show on television that my wife and I used to watch when we first became parents called The Super Nanny, where uh, this nanny would come in and help parents that were struggling with their children. And without fail, you could see that in almost every case, their problem fell into one of those two categories. There was either too much nurture, not enough admonition, or too much admonition and not enough nurture. And the super nanny would just come in and try to balance that out a bit. Now, what is that exact balance? I'm not sure. If you figure it out, let me know. I'm still in the middle of my parenting journey, and I am by no means an expert. But I do believe that as long as we're aware of those two principles and open to correction from the Spirit or other people, 
then we'll probably be able to navigate that balance as, as well as possible. Often, righteous parents teach the principles of the gospel frequently to their children. The things of the Spirit are regularly spoken of. The gospel isn't just something that's talked about on Sunday and then never again until the next week. And though you might get an eye roll and a not this again from time to time, children will be blessed by hearing gospel principles referred to and spoken of frequently. And we can look for opportunities at all times and in many different day-to-day contexts to turn their thoughts towards spiritual things. I really like the word joy in in these verses. Enos mentions that his father often spoke of the joy of the saints. If wickedness never was happiness, then righteousness always was. Living the gospel should bring us joy. But do do we approach it that way in front of our children? When it's time for church, scripture study, family prayer, do we have a smile on our face? Do we have an air of happiness and anticipation? Do we help our children see that the gospel and the commandments aren't the barbed wire fence, but the enfolding arms of Jesus? Do we speak of sacred things with enthusiasm, or do we approach them as a chore and an unwelcome obligation? Do we complain about our church duties or ignore the words of the prophets? Our children need to see the joy of that the gospel brings us. When Joseph Smith restored the doctrine of work for the dead in Doctrine and Covenants 128, he ended that section with an exultant hymn detailing all the wonderful events of the Restoration. And he began that hymn with a question. He asked, Now what do we hear in the gospel which we have received? A voice of blank. What word do you think goes in that blank? The answer is gladness. A voice of gladness is what we hear in the restored gospel. Not a voice of obligation or dreariness or apathy. Our children will be much more likely to want to stick with the path of the restored gospel if they can see how much of a blessing we consider it to be. To speak about it with a voice of gladness. One more here, and I'm going to cheat a little bit on this one. It's two words, sunk deep. This is every parent's greatest desire and the greatest desire for my children. I want the gospel to sink deep into their hearts. And I think this pairs nicely with the word often. I envision a parent regularly sending out truth or faith, or testimony onto the lake of their children's soul. Every time they testify or teach, they're sending out another piece of that truth and faith. And for a time, it may not seem like anything is penetrating. It's just kind of floating out there, never getting beneath the surface. But eventually, after years of teaching, and family nights, and family prayers, and scripture study, and testimonies. Enough has been shared cumulatively that the combined weight of all that we've been taught and shown reaches a critical mass, and that truth sinks deep into their hearts, and their souls begin to hunger. That's what I think happened to Enos that day. All of his parents' efforts came to fruition in that moment, and his faith was forged. So, if it doesn't seem like your children have gotten it yet, if it doesn't seem like they're feeling the power of the Spirit or the Scriptures, don't give up. Keep sending out those truths continually, repeatedly. And who knows, one day it all may just click. and That faith will finally sink deep into their hearts. Now, a quick note about teaching any lesson on parenting. Parents are often very hard on themselves. And if they have a child that is strayed or is making poor decisions, 
it's very hard for them not to take 100% responsibility for that on themselves. They may feel like failures. And they shouldn't. They also worry about other people judging them, which others shouldn't. But still, this shouldn't keep us from teaching parenting principles from the scriptures. But I always make sure in any lesson that I give where parenting is a part of the topic, to include the principle that no parent is perfect and that even the greatest of parents have had children who have strayed or made poor choices in life. Would we judge Sariah and Lehi to be bad parents because of Laman and Lemuel? No, Nephi tells us that they were goodly parents. Would we judge Adam and Eve to be bad parents because of Cain? Mary and Joseph were chosen to raise Jesus, so we know that they were amazing parents. And yet, some of their children didn't accept their brother to be the Son of God. So, so let's be charitable to other parents as well as ourselves. We do our best. We all mess up. And, and barring being negligent, abusive, or absent parents, I think that the Lord will accept our offering as mothers and fathers for being willing to take on this intimidating yet incredible responsibility of raising souls with great mercy and understanding. And I'm not going to include a truth slide here because the truths are going to be discovered by your class. So I don't have one overarching principle to share here. But for a taking it to heart question, you might ask, how could you apply one of the truths that you heard today? And I understand that not everyone you might be teaching are going to be parents. But I believe that we can all benefit from an understanding of these principles. I'm fairly confident that we can all look for and have opportunities to influence and bless the lives of children or young people or just other people in general. These principles apply. In church callings, as siblings, as grandparents, as members of an extended family, or just as a member of a community, we can seek to have a positive spiritual impact on the rising generation and others. So how do these ideas apply to you personally? Seek the Spirit, and I'm sure it can inspire you with some insight and encouragement. So did that help you to see how the Scriptures can be a great parenting manual? In fact, that's a powerful and wonderful method for studying the Scriptures. I did that once on the advice of another great teacher that I know. I read each of the standard works with just that one particular focus in mind. What do the scriptures teach me about parenthood? And I'll tell you that that was one of the most fruitful and eye-opening experiences that I've ever had with the scriptures. And I bear personal witness to you that the scriptures are the greatest parenting manual I've ever read. They're the source of powerful parenting principles. All right, now, Jerem, Omni, and the Words of Mormon. We've still got three books to go. They're all very short books and just one chapter long. And as a teacher, if I only had a limited time to teach the materials of this week's lesson, I'd probably focus my attention mainly on Enos. But if you have more time, you could do a little something with these three small books. And to start us out, I just want to give you a little bit of background on each one. So, Jerem was written by Enos's son, who then becomes the next prophet leader of the Nephites. And Jerem was a righteous man who, according to verse 2, had the spirit of prophecy and revelation. But he decides not to record his prophecies and revelations because he felt that his fathers had sufficiently covered the plan of salvation in their writings. The book of Jerem is the shortest book in the Book of Mormon, and in terms of time, covers about 59 years of Nephite history from about 420 B.C. to 361 B.C. The book of Omni, though, covers a very large swath of time in Nephite history, despite being so small. From 361 B.C. to 130 B.C. 
a whopping 231 years passes in this very short book. And Omni is not the only author of this book. In fact, I almost feel like Omni doesn't really deserve to have a book named after him in the Book of Mormon. Because he only writes three verses. And in those verses reveals that he's a wicked man who didn't keep the statutes and the commandments of the Lord, as he ought to have done. It almost seems like he just, at the end of his life, quickly grabs the plates, writes a few things, and then passes them on to his son. Because, well, that's kind of what you're supposed to do. You really get the sense in the book of Omni that the purpose for this spiritual record-keeping in the plates kind of gets lost. There are five different writers in the book of Omni. And the next few are almost a bit of a joke as, as the plates get handed down from one person to the next without much thought or substance in their words. For a good example of this, just take a quick look at verse 9, where a man named Chemish writes his one sole verse in the Book of Mormon. And what profound message does he have to share with us? He says, Now I, Chemish, write what few things I write, in the same book with my brother. For behold, I saw the last which he wrote, that he wrote it with his own hand. And he wrote it in the day that he delivered them unto me. And after this manner we keep the records, for it is according to the commandments of our fathers. And I make an end. Ah, oh, poetry, right? Great are the words of Chemish. <laughs> but, you know, if I could change something in the Book of Mormon, I'd probably change the name of the Book of Omni to the Book of Amalekai. Because he actually does have something of worth to share in this book. He's going to catch us up on Nephite history, which is going to set the stage for what's going to happen in Mosiah. And he adds some spiritual insight for us as well. And then finally, the words of Mormon are a flash forward of sorts. You may have heard of a flashback, but this small book is a flash forward. We jump from 130 BC all the way to 385 AD, to the time of Mormon who is at that time compiling and abridging the history of the Nephites into what will become what we now know as the Book of Mormon. And I don't feel the need to go into all the ins and outs of how the Book of Mormon was compiled and small plates and large plates and what was found on each one. If you really want a good explanation of how all of that fits together, I'd recommend you read a brief explanation about the Book of Mormon in the introductory pages. But it suffices me to say that the words of Mormon are a brief explanatory statement made by Mormon to inform us that he had decided to include this record from the small plates of Nephi after abridging a portion of the large plates. He tells us that he's doing this for a wise purpose, but it's apparent that he's not exactly sure what that purpose is, just that the Spirit is inspiring him to do it. And so there's a little bit of background. But with these books, I like to do a brief activity called Big Truths from Small Books. And I like to highlight just one scripture gem hiding in each of these small books. And so I do a group activity where I break up my class into groups of three and assign each person in the group one of the following verses. Jerem 1.11 Omni 1.26, and Words of Mormon 1.7. And then I ask them to be prepared to teach the other two people in their group a truth that their verses teach them. I give them about four to five minutes to prepare what they're going to say, and then they take turns teaching each other. Now, depending on the spiritual maturity of your class, you could just leave it at that. Sometimes I like to give them a little bit of help. So for each verse, I have a small slip of paper with a few simple questions to consider and one quote from a general authority that they could use to elaborate on their passage. And I'm going to lead you through these and just give you a, a bit of brief commentary on each one. So Jerem 1.11 Wherefore the prophets and the priests and the teachers did labor diligently, exhorting with all longsuffering the people to diligence, teaching the law of Moses and the intent for which it was given, persuading them to look forward unto the Messiah 
and believe in him to come as though he already was. And after this manner did they teach them. So the question, what does this verse teach you about teaching in the church? Well, I think it's a great verse on how to become an effective gospel teacher. They labor diligently. They're long-suffering with those who they teach, which means they're patient, loving, and understanding. They teach gospel truths to the intent for which they were given, not their own intent or personal agenda. And they teach by persuasion, not force, not charisma, not bribery, but persuasion. I think that's some pretty good advice on how to teach with power. And then another question. Like the Nephites, we too are waiting for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ, to appear. For the second time, how can we believe and live as though he already was? I really like this thought. Jesus Christ is a present Savior, not just a future Savior. It's possible for us to live our lives as though he already was here. Because Jesus is the living Christ. Not just somebody who lived a long time ago or somebody that's going to live with us again someday. His power his atonement, his teachings, his love can be an integral part of our lives now. And hopefully that changes us now in the present. I really like this quote from Dallin H. Oaks. What if the day of his coming were tomorrow? If we knew that we would meet the Lord tomorrow through our premature death or his unexpected coming, what would we do today? What confessions would we make? What practices would we discontinue? What accounts would we settle? What forgivenesses would we extend? What testimonies would we bear? If we would do those things then, why not now? All right. Omni chapter 1 verse 26. And now, my beloved brethren, I would that ye should come unto Christ, who is the Holy One of Israel, and partake of his salvation and the power of his redemption. Yea, come unto him, and offer your whole souls as an offering unto him, and continue in fasting and prayer, and endure to the end. And as the Lord liveth, ye will be saved. So, according to this verse, what must we do to be saved? A lot of good ones in there. Come unto Christ, partake of his salvation, the power of his redemption, Offer your whole souls as an offering to him. Continue in fasting and prayer and endure to the end. And I'm really, really intrigued by the phrase, offer your whole souls as an offering unto him. How does somebody offer their whole souls as an offering unto God? Well, Neil A. Maxwell said it best, in my opinion. The submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. The many other things we give, brothers and sisters, are actually the things he has already given or loaned to us. However, when you and I finally submit ourselves by letting our individual wills be swallowed up in God's will, then we are really giving something to him. It's the only possession which is truly ours to give. So uh, the greatest and only real sacrifice we can make is our will, to offer up a broken heart and a contrite spirit to Him. How do we do that? Obedience. Unquestioning, unwavering, dedicated and loyal obedience to His will. Fully trusting that His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts than our thoughts. All right, last one. Words of Mormon 1, 7. And I do this for a wise purpose, for thus it whispereth me, according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord, which is in me. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore, he worketh in me to do according to his will. Now, keep in mind that as Mormon's writing this, that he didn't understand why he was including the record of the small plates of Nephi 
in addition to his abridgment of the large plates. All he knows is that the Spirit is prompting him to do it for a wise purpose. Now, we know what the wise purpose is. It's to prepare a way for us to receive this record of Nephi in spite of the loss of the 116 pages of the Book of Mormon manuscript in early church history. This quote from Elder Brooke P. Hales can help us to understand the significance of this. The scriptures teach us, For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And he knoweth all things, for all things are present before his eyes. The prophet Mormon is an example of this. He did not live to see the results of his work. Yet he understood that the Lord was carefully leading him along. When he felt inspired to include the small plates of Nephi with his record, Mormon wrote, And I do this for a wise purpose, for thus it whispereth me according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord which is in me. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore he worketh in me to do according to his will. Although Mormon did not know of the future loss of the 116 manuscript pages, the Lord did, and prepared a way to overcome that obstacle long before it occurred. So the question that I ask you to consider is, why do you think it's important to follow the whisperings of the Spirit, even when we don't understand why? I think that that's one of the hardest ways for us to be obedient. When the Spirit asks us to take a leap of faith, or a step into the darkness, and demonstrate our trust in our Father in Heaven. And there are a lot of ways that we can demonstrate that trust. Serving a mission even when you're not sure how you're going to fulfill its demands on you. Paying your tithing when you're not sure how you'll be able to manage it financially. Accepting a church calling even though you don't feel qualified. Saying something to somebody that you feel prompted to say even though you don't know why and fear that it might be awkward. Obeying a commandment or standard that you don't completely understand or accepting a church doctrine or policy that doesn't totally make sense to you. There are lots of opportunities to demonstrate this kind of faith. Just remember that there's a being out there who sees the end from the beginning and how lucky we are that he is willing to grant us a hint of that divine perspective through the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. And, and that is going to do it for these small books. Like I said, big truths, small books. And that's also going to conclude our lesson for today. Although, heads up, I will be including a couple of additional thoughts on leadership from the second half of the Words of Mormon next week. Because I think it goes really well with the first couple of chapters from Mosiah. And we'll also be revisiting the Book of Omni for some historical background to some of the events in Mosiah because it kind of gives us some good context for what's going on there. But with that, I want to thank all of you for taking this time to study the scriptures with me today. And I pray that you got something out of it, that you felt the Spirit, and that if you're a teacher, you feel more confident, excited, and prepared to go and teach your classes. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.